your presence. God, we just thank you for, for your holiness, for your love. Lord, we just thank you that your eye is upon us. Lord, we thank you that you're doing a work in our hearts and the hearts of everyone in this body. God, we give you praise for the fact that you are intimately acquainted with us. And Lord, we just say that we want our hearts to be wholly yours. We want all the impurities to be out, God, because it's your great love. It's your great love. You say that those whom you love, you reveal their faults to. And, and Father, even this righteousness, even as you said that you were coming into your temple and you were bringing that fiery ladder, Lord God, and we just thank you for that fiery ladder of your presence and that you're sitting as a refiner's fire and a smelter of gold to purify the sons of Levi that we might offer up to you uh, sacrifices in righteousness, God. And that's the righteous acts of the saints, Lord God. That's what the bridal garments would be, will be, the righteous acts of the saints clothed in that wedding garment. And God, we say yes to that. God, we say yes to that. We want you, God. We want you to increase. And we want to decrease. We want to see you have your way in each of us, God. We want you regardless of what we have to pay. We want, we, and that's going to be our life. You want us to come and to be identified with you at the cross and not to, not to despise the, the discipline of the Lord, but to embrace what you're doing because you're doing such a sweet work, God. You're doing a sweet work, even though it may not be fun. We thank you that we ask that you anoint our heads with fresh oil as we go through this place and that we would know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. And Father, through the suffering comes that deep intimacy that you'll bring us all into that place of deep intimacy with you. And Father, we thank you for the word today. And God, we pray, we open up our hearts and we ask for revelation, O oh God. We ask that you, Holy Spirit, give us a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation of him. Enlighten the eyes of our heart that we'll truly know the hope of our calling. O oh God, we ask for that. And Father, we pray for, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence and come and empower Ken. We ask that you come and take over. We ask for the full release of your spirit, Lord God. And we ask that you just come and you release your power, release your spirit of conviction, oh God. We just pray that you would come and you would speak to us and that we would all hear, that we would all obey what we hear, that we will build our house upon the rock, oh God, and that we would receive this word on travail. Oh God, not that we try to make any of it happen, but we'll, we, we will be vessels that are available to you to use so that we can birth your burden into the earth, oh God. We just ask for your grace and your power to be released and speak not by power nor by might, through, but through your spirit, through Ken, we ask in Jesus' name. Yes, amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. Amen. All right, let's uh, open our Bibles to uh, the book of Galatians. Uh, chapter 4, verse 19. I just want to read in just a moment, I want to read that one verse, a uh, short verse, but powerful. Um, we are in a three or so week series on strengthening golden altar prayer. Uh, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about, explain again what that is just in review in a minute. But we're strengthening golden altar prayer. And Last week and this week, we're talking about welcoming travailing prayer, which is a dimension or an aspect of praying golden altar uh, prayer. Uh, and today, I want to do uh, the, the title of today's message is tra Travailing for Christ to be Formed in Us. Travailing for Christ to be Formed in Us, uh, which is uh, a major purpose of why at least at our church, at Restoration Life and in Life School, we want to welcome travail. It's travail for the purpose of seeing 
Christ formed in his church, in us individually, in this church, in life school, but also in the church globally. And so uh, if we read from Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, here's what Paul said. And speaking about himself, he says, My children, with whom I am again in labor, and uh, if you look at the King James Version, it will say travail, in whom I am again in travail or labor until Christ is formed in you. He's, until, he's laboring, he's praying, he's working, he's a, he's a messenger. He, he is one who's a, who's a builder. He's building churches. He's speaking truth. He's interceding. He's doing all of these things. And one of the objectives, one of the primary objectives of Paul's ministry was to labor to do these things until Christ uh, was formed in his church. Uh, you know, he says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in us. And so, you know, Paul's writings are throughout are talking about, about Christ being formed in us. You know, we, we are saved through Christ. We're justified through Christ. But he's in us through the person of the Holy Spirit in seed form, but that's to come out in fullness. And so Paul spends his ministry laboring. Uh, one of the primary objectives is to see Christ come forth in fullness in the church so that believers become a complete and exact representation of Christ in the earth uh, in fullness so that when, when a lost person sees you and sees me, they don't see us in the natural, but they see who we are in the spirit. We see, they see us in Christ as a representation of Christ. And so Paul was, was doing that. And the purpose of this message is to kind of discern the is to express our purpose, what God is using us as a purpose uh, to pray, to travail, that Christ would be formed in his church. Uh, that's our call. So let's do a little bit of review first from last week. We talked uh, about an introductory message about travail last week. Uh, and basically, what we talked about was, uh, was three things there. We, we talked about a burden, a fervency and a manifestation of travail. We talked about uh, how travail works, a kind of a basic message on uh, the travailing prayer. And we talked about the fact that what we're really looking for is an increased burden. God wants to release a burden uh, in his church for the things that are on his heart. Uh, you know, God in heaven, he, he has burdens for a lot of things. Uh, you know, he's, he's full of joy. He's, he, he, God has a, a great sense of humor. I'm convinced of that. Uh, but it, uh, he's also very burdened for certain situations and things in the earth. And I believe right now God is very, very burdened about the condition of the, the world. But I think even more than the burden about the condition of the world, he's, he is burdened about the condition of the world of the church. He's tremendously burdened for the condition uh, uh, of, of the church. And what he wants is he wants his church to connect with that burden that he has in the heavens. He wants us to connect with that burden and to feel his burden, to feel his grief, to feel his pain. And you know, when he's in joy, he wants us to feel uh, his joy. So it's not just grief and pain and burden he wants us to feel. He wants us to feel his emotions, you know, whatever they may be. But right now, our focus is on travail, and travail comes when we, when we connect with the burden of the Lord, those things that he has grieved for, those things that are, that are, that are on his heart. That, that trouble him and that want, he wants to see change. He wants us to connect with that. And so that's the first step of travailing prayer is connecting with the burden of the Lord. Whatever the Lord is burdened for, he wants us to be burdened for that. And then the second aspect, of the, again still in review, is that he's wanting us to have a fervency, a fervency to, to pray uh, into that burden with a tremendous passion, a tremendous fervency uh, in our hearts. Uh, and I really believe that's, that's kind of the next step in our golden altar prayer ministry. He's wanting us to develop 
uh, a deeper burden and a deeper fervency uh, for the prayer. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing this message, you know, we're for about now, about a year now, uh, since the Lord really called us and summoned us, commissioned us to begin to pray golden altar prayers, the prayers of Revelation chapter 8 that will ascend to the, to the golden altar. It was in July of last year, so we're pretty much a, a year into it. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about it. Well, you know, I'm really encouraged and excited about where we are there. I mean, we have four golden altar prayer groups. And, uh, you know, the, a good percentage of the church is involved in at least one of those groups, some in multiple uh, groups. Uh, you know, I'd love to have 100%. And, you know, maybe we will get to that point eventually. I think that's God's desire. But we have a significant percentage in terms of numbers. Uh, and so we've, we've met that first step of, you know, participating in Golden Altar Prayer. But where the Lord has us now, and I think the next season in Golden Altar Prayer is for us to increase our burden, for us to have a greater burden for, uh, for this type of prayer and for what's on the heart of God. And then out of that burden to increase our fervency, our passion, the depth of that. Uh, for this, you know, as it says in James, it's the fervent prayer of a righteous man that accomplishes much. You know, we can pray lukewarm type prayers where our heart is far away uh, from where, our, where uh, the Lord's heart is. We can pray like that, and when we do, not much is accomplished. But when we connect with fervency, when, when we, we, we hear God's voice, we hear our, His heart, and we know what He's saying, and then we connect in fervent prayer with that, then we can really accomplish much. So, uh, again, we start with burden, and then fervency, and then out of fervency, and out of a fervency of prayer, out of a heart of burden, then travail comes. We don't, travail is not something that we can actually make happen. Uh, we can welcome it. But travail is the work of the Holy Spirit in His sovereignty and in His and His uh, 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 fullness, as He would choose uh, to speak to us or to release upon us. So we have that we can have the burden as we ask for it. We can pray with fervency into that burden, and then travail comes in the sovereignty of God. And travail are things like tears, uh, things like uh, groaning, and as it talks about in Romans chapter eight. Uh, things like pain of, that, were, that would be similar to the pain of, of childbirth. Uh, you know, those types of things, lamenting and uh, just uh, wailing and, and all of those kind of things. We want to welcome that in, in the appropriate times and seasons because that's a manifestation that is very important. I mean, it's, it's like the, you know, you labor... You know, when, when a woman is pregnant, she carries a child uh, for nine months. But then at the end, right before the child is birthed, there's labor and there's intensity. And there's, uh, you know, a lot of times there's pain, there's, uh, uh, you know, anguish, there's crying. Uh, I mean, I've never encountered it. Thank you, Lord. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, you know, I've, I've been around Donna four times when she has given birth. And we, as pastors, we've been involved with others who have given birth. And there's pain of childbirth and struggle with childbirth. So that's where travail is. But that's, that happens right at the end when you're birthing the solution to what God, uh, God's issues are, what, is, what the problems are, what the issues are that you're praying for. And so travail is important because it is part of the birthing the solution to the, the problems that God has put on our heart, the burden that's in our heart. Uh, and so God is wanting us to welcome that, to move from just participating in golden altar prayer now to taking on a deeper fervency, a deeper burden of the heart of God, a deeper crying out that would at times... Uh, include the pains, the struggles, the lamenting, the mourning, all of that, the grief of childbirth of, or of uh, birthing something in the spirit. So that's kind of where we are. Um, but what I want to what, what say 
now is I want to narrow that focus for what God wants us to really be praying for. Now, we can pray for a lot of things, and there are a lot of things you can travail for. Uh, you know, you can travail for a spouse that is, uh, you know, drifted away from, from love or com for commitment. You can, you can travail for a child that's, uh, that is a, that's is a, become a prodigal and gone uh, the wrong way. You can travail for, you know, a lot of issues, a lot of situations, for job situations. You can travail for a lot of things. And it, I'm not saying that's wrong, but those kind of prayers are not the kind of prayers that ascend to the golden altar. Uh, the, the prayers that are sent to the golden altar are prayers that are focused on the eternal purposes of God from a heavenly perspective. Those are things that fit into the counsel of God uh, from eternity past in terms of where he's leading his church, what he's wanting to see happen in his church from a heavenly perspective. And so even, you know, things for our nation may not fit into the eternal purposes of God. Things that we might, might normally want to pray for, even as it relates to a nation, may not be uh, inconsistent or consistent with the eternal purposes uh, of God. So golden altar prayer is prayer that focuses on those things. And that's what, that's what the Lord is wanting us to do in our golden altar groups, is to take the, have the burden, pray with fervency, welcome travail, but into this one issue of praying into the eternal purposes of God from a heavenly perspective. And so, you know, in the notes I've listed two purposes, but they're really part of the same thing. Uh, the one purpose is to pray into the eternal purposes of God from a heavenly perspective. And the second is to pray for the coming forth of the man-child of Revelation chapter 12. And we've talked a good bit about that in, in prior weeks. Uh, that's part of the eternal purposes of God. Uh, and so the Lord is saying to us, travail for these things to happen. And what I'm going to say in a moment will lead us to the understanding that Christ in us, formed in us, is critical for the eternal purposes of God to be fulfilled and for the man-child to come forth in fullness. And so our labor has to be for Christ to be formed in us. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about the eternal purposes of God and then I'll talk a little bit about the man-child to kind of put it into the context of why we need to be praying for Christ to be formed uh, in us. Let's talk about the eternal counsel, eternal purpose uh, of God. Uh, God's eternal purpose, basically, I think we could boil it down to this, for mankind is, and you see this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. We're not going to turn there. Uh, but you see what God wants to do, and has been working on it from the very beginning, uh, since the fall, is he wants to unite heaven uh, and earth as one. You know, that's, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, before the fall, uh, God walked among Adam and Eve. He walked in the garden. They were united uh, in, in unity and in fellowship where there was intimacy and there was communion and they were together uh, in the Garden of Eden. Of course, the fall derailed that. But you see, you see that, that, that the eternal purpose of God is to once again unite heaven and earth as one. We see this at the end of the Bible, at the end of the book of Revelation, with the coming down of the new Jerusalem, coming down, the bride made ready. What do we see? We see God coming down from heaven, joining uh, with earth in, into one. That's the eternal uh, purpose uh, of that. So we see that that's, that is where God is wanting to lead uh, his church, where he comes together. He's wanting, God is wanting a multitude of overcoming mature sons for the heavenly father and he's wanting a equally yoked bride for the son living in a spiritual house ultimately called the new Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit the house for the Holy Spirit called the new Jerusalem that's what God is wanting to do that's the eternal purpose of God if in a big picture way is to join heaven and earth as one to prepare uh, a, a multitude of sons for the Father 
to prepare an equally yoked bride for the son to live forever in the new Jerusalem and to use them in partnership with the Godhead for eternity to spread the gospel throughout the vastness of God's creation, whatever that may mean. And so, you know, we're not just going to go to heaven and float around on a cloud. God has a plan and a purpose and a usefulness for his people forever and ever and ever and ever. And we're in this season, our life being this season where God is preparing us. He's preparing us for uh, these things. And so that's the, uh, that's the eternal purpose uh, of God. Now, let's talk about the man-child. Uh, we're not going to turn there because we've talked a lot about it over the last few months. But Revelation chapter 12 talks about a woman uh, who in our day is a, is a picture of the end-time church, the church. And she births a man-child. Uh, Revelation 12, 5. She births a, a man-child. And, the, the, you know, the big discussion, the big issue, is, is the man-child Jesus or is the man-child the overcoming church? And here we believe, and we have a lot of reasons for this, we believe that the man-child is the, is the overcomers, those in the church who have overcome. Revelation 12, 11. They've overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and the fact that they have loved their life not even until death. And so they have overcome. And so the man-child will be used, which is a, is a general description of the overcoming sons for the father and the equally yoked bride for the son. It's the same people. It's just a general description of that that you see the church birthing a mature remnant within it. All are invited, not, you know, predestination where you're called to this and you're not, and, but all are invited, but not everybody will pay the price for it, uh, who will overcome and be used in, in mighty ways, even to initiate, as we talked about in other sessions, even to initiate the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And so we see this eternal plan of God and we see the man child of the overcoming the, bride, the equally yoked bride for the, for the son the mature sons for the father being used uh, in unique ways uh, that are part of that journey to the eternal city but see there's steps along that journey and the, that, that overcoming remnant called the man child the bride the the sons of God, are used in every one of those steps. Uh, if you think about the, the journey to the, uh, to the eternal city, what do you see? You see uh, even the days that we're in now where darkness is, is increasing, darkness is getting darker, but you see at the same time the glory uh, potentially being released upon the church. God wants to use the church in, in the increasing darkness uh, in glory. Uh, we see the great and the terrible day of the Lord coming. Now, the terrible day of the Lord will be a, a time when pressure's intensity come in, in such great ways that it will be difficult for, the, for people to stand, for the church, for believers to stand. And many will take the mark of the beast. Many will fall away from the faith. Uh, but those who have overcome, those who have allowed the work of the Holy Spirit uh, to, to work in their lives in powerful, deep, deep ways will be able to stand in the pressures of what is coming in the days ahead. And so that's the man-child who will be able to stand. That's the bride who will be able to stand. That's the overcoming sons who will be able to stand in those days. But then there's also another dimension of the day of the Lord. There's the great day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord, is great because God will use his church in partnership with Jesus in great authority through our intercession and through our ministry as an end time messenger that God will be using us in powerful, powerful ways, uh, glorious ways that we can't even imagine or fathom right now. God wants to use those ways, but it is that bride that those sons, that a man-child, that will be used that way. All are invited, but not every believer will be used in great authority. Only the one who has allowed him to work deeply in our hearts. And then we move from there to the second coming and the judgment seat of Christ where rewards are handed out. 
And those things are handed out based on Christ in us and how much we become the, taken on the nature of Christ. Uh, we will be judged and given eternal rewards, eternal positions, eternal authority based on uh, that work of being prepared as the bride, being, may, being allowed Christ to come forth in us. And then you see the millennial kingdom and you see the thousand year reign of Christ and, and those that have allowed God to work in their lives now will be used in those ways in, during that thousand years of millennial reign. And then you see the new Jerusalem coming down and those who will dwell eternally in the new Jerusalem are the ones who have allowed God to make themselves ready now. And so here's what we see. We see, we see a people who become a full representation of Christ in body, soul, and spirit who, uh, who, are, who represent Jesus in the earth, who have made themselves ready by, them, by a work of cooperation with the Holy Spirit and by the grace of God, we see them become the equally yoked bride. We see them become the overcoming sons for the father. We see them becoming that man-child company. We see them used in great authority in the great day of the Lord. We see them standing in the terrible day of the Lord. We see them victorious, blameless at the judgment seat of Christ. We see them used with great authority in the millennial kingdom, and we see them dwelling in the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, and used in partnership in the ultimate mission base, uh, the new Jerusalem, for its ages and ages and ages to come, whatever those things might be and whatever that might mean. So we see that happening, but the people... The people that are used in those ways in every section or every phase of the, of the ages are a people who have taken on the nature of Christ in fullness. Where they've allowed the Holy Spirit, the, t the washing of the water of the word, the cooperation in their hearts, They've allowed God to do a work in them to crucify and set free their self-life, move them from sin uh, to where they have not only just confessed it, but they've overcome it, different issues in their lives, so that they are become a full representation of Jesus in the earth. In other words, when they see when the Lord sees us, he sees Christ. When the world sees us, he sees Christ. Full in fullness. That's, that's, where, that's where the Lord is leading. He wants us, he wants his church, not just us, but he wants his church to be a full representation of Jesus in the earth. Now, let me bring it back to travailing prayer and golden altar prayer. Let me bring it back to Galatians chapter 4, 19. Paul said, I labor, or I, King James says, I travail for what? That Christ be formed in us. And so, see, that's the purpose. That's, that's why we are doing Ultimately, big picture purpose of why we're doing golden altar prayer. I mean, there are other dimensions of it. We talked about praying for the city and, and a re resisting the work of the enemy in the city of Atlanta. That was a few weeks ago. We talked about that. And that's part of what we're to do. But a big part, major theme of our intercessory golden altar prayer and why we travail is to labor, to birth, in fervency, Christ to be formed in his church. So that, the, so that the seed form of Christ, which came when we're born again, when we're born again, every believer who's born again got the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in us, in seed form. But it's to come forth in fullness. It's to come forth in fullness. 
and as it comes forth in fullness, then it's a mature Christ within us, which is what really we call spiritual maturity, till we become Christ-like. That's, that's what we have to labor for. That's what we have to travail for. We have to cry out in our golden altar prayer times that God would produce a people uh, who take on the nature of Christ in fullness. So they're made ready, made ready for what God has for them and for what is coming in the ages to come. He wants us to travail for those things. Let's look at another uh, scripture verse in terms of Christ in us and just uh, we've quoted this verse a lot uh, as well, but 1 Thessalonians 5.23. This is one that would be worth memorizing or getting in your heart where you know, you know it in and out. But may, God, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. And so he says, may the God of peace sanctify you. In other words, when we say sanctify, that means holy, means set apart. May the God of peace set you apart completely. So we could say it this way, and I think we would not be violating the context of that verse. May God do a work so that you are become his possession, where he possesses you. You know, First Peter says that we are God's own possession. Where God owns us, where, where he is our life, he possesses us, sanctifies us completely, set apart from the world, set apart from the flesh, set apart from the demonic uh, strongholds so that he owns us, so he becomes our life. May the God of peace do that in body, soul, and spirit. Now body, what do we think about when we think about uh, setting, our, uh, what do we think about our body? You know, we all have different looking bodies, you know, I mean, uh, some of us have bigger stomachs than others and other, you know, different things. Yeah, but that's not what he's talking about. You know, what are, what are the cravings of our, our bodily cravings, you know? They want pleasure. They want comfort. You know, things like that. And so he's wanting to sanctify our tongues. You know, our speech where we bless one and curse another. He wants to bring that under the control of the Holy Spirit. He wants to, uh, he wants to sanctify uh, our, our eyes, what we look at. He wants to sanctify uh, our hands, what we put our work to, our hands to. He wants to sanctify our feet, where we go, where we walk. Uh, you know, he wants to sanctify us. Uh, you, know, I'm, you know, I think there's no children in the room here. He wants to sac sanctify, uh, you know, our sexuality and all that is involved there. That it will be set apart completely, completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's going to sanctify our soul. You know, it's not just our actions. He's not just look after our actions. He's after our soul. And our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions in our heart. And so what he's wanting to do, he's wanting to set apart. He's wanting to set apart for his purposes uh, our mind. He's wanting our mind to be focused on things above and not upon worldly things. And, I, you know, I know as much as you do, that's a huge, huge challenge for every one of us to get our mind set on things above rather than upon, uh, uh, upon the world and sin and self issues. But he's wanting to sanctify our thought life. He's want to he wants to sanctify our choices. 
where our choices are absolutely, totally, completely submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Every choice that we make. You know, that doesn't mean you can't, you have to make sure God wants you to, you know, go cut the grass or something. I'm not saying that, but there are major, there are major issues that every one of us take and we make them based on what we think, what we feel, what we would think would be the best decision rather than, rather than the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Every choice he wants to be under his Lordship. Our thought life, our choices, our emotions, you know, he's wanting those things to be under the Lordship of, 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 of Christ. Our heart attitudes, so, so God is, that's what's going to make us Christ-like. Is when we crucify sin, we allow him to crucify, we go to the cross and allow him to crucify sin. When we crucify not only sin, but we crucify self. Where we place where it's not necessarily a sinful thing. But in and of itself, but when it's out of priority, it becomes a self-issue that is placed above the Lordship of, of Christ. We need to set ourselves apart or allow Him to set ourselves apart uh, from uh, the demonic realm. You know, you know, we'll, we will not represent Christ fully if we, to the degree we're demonized. And Christians can be demonized. And so we need, to, we need to be sanctified, set apart, you know, completely body, soul, and spirit. And let me just go to one more verse, of section of Scripture, Galatians. Go back to Galatians for a minute. And then I'm going to tie it back into travail. This, in Galatians chapter 5, there's a great, I mean, challenging, but great comparison between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And so we have to overcome these works of the flesh. Now the deeds of the, verse 519, Galatians 519, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, uh, enmity or hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Which he says, I forewarn you, just as I forewarn that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Now what is he saying there? Uh, he's saying that if we're going to take on the nature of Christ in fullness, we have to push those issues out of our lives, those deeds of the flesh. Those, that list, that first list I read. That we have to overcome those things. Now, it's a lifelong journey to do that. We have to overcome that, but we have to also build, build in, in us the good things of the Spirit, love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All those things have to be built in us. And so it will not happen in the church on a widespread spread basis. It will not, not happen here without travailing prayer. That's, that's when, we, when Brian first started teaching on overcomers, which is just another way of saying really similar types of things. That's the process for taking on Christ's likeness, the nature of Christ is overcoming. When Brian first started teaching that, one of the things the Lord spoke to me very clearly was that we will not become overcomers without travailing prayer to birth that mindset, that determination, that willpower 
that a connection with God in our church to see that take place. And it's clear in the scripture. The scripture the Lord gave me was Revelation chapter 12. Well, the woman was in travail to birth the man-child, the one who took on the nature of Christ. We must be in travail to birth that. We must be fervent. We must have a burden for it for our own life. We must have a burden for it for our own church. We must have a burden for it for those that God has entrusted life school, entrusted to us through life school. We must be, have a burden for it for the church in America and around the world that God would, would use us to travail to see this person, these people, uh, overcome the self and sin life and be sanctified entirely in body, soul, and spirit to take on the nature of Christ in fullness. That's the travailing prayer that the Lord wants for us, for us to, to intercede for. One more, let me just give you one more uh, illustration of that, one more type. And I've talked about this off and on in prior messages, but we're not going to turn there. But 1 Samuel chapter 1 is a beautiful picture of how we need to travail for these things. You know, in, you know I'll just share the story. I'll just summarize the story real quickly. You know, there was a, there was a man named Elkanah, uh, and he had two wives. He had H Hannah. And he had Peniana, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing those names right. He had two wives. Uh, Peniana had a lot of sons and daughters. She had a lot of children. Hannah was barren. Now, Elkanah loved Hannah even more than Peniana. And he gave her, in fact, a double portion of the provision. But Peniana was was irritated, was provoked probably because she sensed that Elkanah loved Hannah more than her. And she was provoked by that. She provoked her and irritated her. But Hannah was desperate. She was burdened for a child. And that barrenness, that burdenness that she saw, and it wasn't just even in her own life because she dedicated this child to the Lord. She saw the land, the nature of the land and the, the corrupt priesthood. She saw that Eli was, uh, was passive and that his sons were corrupt. And so there was a Laodicean attitude in the, in the priesthood. And the land was in chaos. And she was burdened for that. Hannah was burdened for that. She was desperate to, for a child to be born. And she said, Lord, if you'll give me a child, I'll devote him to you all the days of my life. But she says, and you see it in the King James really clearly. She said, if you'll give me a man-child. It says man-child in, in verse 11, chapter 1 of the King James. If you'll give me a man-child, I'll devote him to the Lord. And Samuel's name means one whose name is God. Or, and, you know, name in biblical sense is character. So we could just say this. If you'll give me a child whose character fully represents God, I'll devote him to you all the days of my life. And so she cried out. She travailed. She fasted. She prayed. She would not be comforted until Samuel was born, till she conceived a Samuel. And that's, that's the attitude that we have to have. You know, you see the attitude in Elkanah and Peniana. You see this attitude of comfort and, and acceptance. In, in fact, Elkanah said, Hannah, why are you fasting? Why are you crying? Am I not better than you than a bunch of sons and daughters, ten sons? And she wouldn't be comforted. But see, that's the attitude of the church. It's almost like there's two churches. There's two brides in the earth right now. There's the ones who have the burden to see things changed. And then there's the one who's content and comfortable. Seeking your best life now type church. And then there's the one who's burdened because they see in the spirit the barrenness that's in the church. They see what's coming. 
the issues that are coming down the road and they say we need a church that's prepared and they won't be comforted they have a burden and they travail they intercede until a Samuel is born one who takes on the nature and, and taking it to the New Testament the nature of Christ in fullness and so what God is saying to us is he's saying you, you can't be a peniana. You can't be content with the status quo. You must have a burden. You must pray fervently. You must travail until Christ is formed in his church. In you individually, me individually, as church corporately, but beyond that, you know, as a, as a forerunner ministry, that is the number one assignment. More so than preaching, more so than proclamation, is to intercede that the, the, those who represent the nature of Christ in fullness can come forth, the man-child, the bride, all the same, different ways of saying the same thing, can come forth in fullness. That is our number one assignment. Now beyond that, there are other things. There's life school and training pastors and making, you know, casting the vision for them to become the bride. There's the, the, the end time messengers. There's the master builders. There's all these different dimensions that come out of that. But the foundation, the fuel, the drive, the, 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 the priority number one is the intercession the fervency, the burden, the travail to see Christ formed in his church. And that's what we're called to do. That's, that's, the, that's, where we're, that's the next step of building golden altar prayers. Uh, we've, we've established a pretty good network for our size I, I think it is anyway a good network of people I would love to have everybody involved in it but but we've got probably 60 70 percent of the church involved in one of those groups or, or or more so we have a good representation of people in the church participating but now we've got to labor we've got to, we've got to take on the burden in a deeper way we've got to cry out We've got to be like Hannah. We've got to say, I'm not going to be comforted until we begin to see these types of things happening in our church, but also in the church. It's the travail of golden altar prayers. And so it's praying things, and, and I just jotted a few things down in the, the last couple pages of your notes. It's praying things like praying that God would separate soul from spirit in the lives of believers. Pray that people do not resist the work that God is doing in us in this season. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, we're all comfortable in our self-life. You know, not so much, some, maybe some degree sin, but a lot of it's self. Where I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it. So we need to pray in accordance with, with what was written in Galatians 4.19 to labor that Christ be formed in us so that the deeds of the flesh, Galatians 5.16.21, would be taken to the cross so as to be crucified in us and delivered from us. You know, Father, we pray that, we pray just like this, we pray that, um, that you would deal with this church and the church in areas of immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, strife, jealousy, anger, disputes, etc. You, you know, pray that those kinds of things would, would, would come forth and that the fruit of the Spirit would come forth in their place. Travail for adoption as mature sons who would inherit firstborn status. You know, we didn't get to Romans chapter 8, but it's another verse about uh, the spirit groaning within us, travailing within us, and this is the, the for the the coming forth of the, of mature sons. You know the overcoming sons for the Father. Uh, we need to travail 
for those uh, things. So that's just the examples. There, there are a lot of different prayers we can pray. No, it's not okay, and, and, and it's not okay. Okay, that, I guess it's good, Patricia. All right, let's, okay, yeah. It's, it's, not, a, it, it's not okay that we stay in the status quo, absolutely. Yeah, that's the message. Um, so what God is saying to us, he's saying, he's saying to us to come forth into this, to go deeper. Yeah, yeah. And he's wanting us to do it. And so we, may, we need to say yes to it. We need to say yes to it. Yeah. Let's go, let's just stand up and let's pray and let's ask the Lord to, to do what he wants to do. Father, we thank you that you're calling us to deeper intercession, deeper travail. We thank you for that, Father, and we ask, God, that you would now just receive from the Lord. Don't be distracted by anything that's happened right now. Let's just, be, let's just focus on God. Father, we want to welcome an increased burden. We want to welcome an increased burden of the Lord. We say to you, Father, we long to, to travail for Christ, for laboring to, for Christ to be formed in us and to be formed in others, O oh God. We pray for that in Jesus' name. We cry out, God, that you would increase the burden of the Lord upon each and every one of us, O oh God. Do your work, Holy Spirit. Father, I even sense that even today there's been an awakening in some of the hearts where people didn't understand what all this was about. But today has been, a, has been a day where there's been an awakening of that. And we say, so Father, we say, do it, God. We ask for that, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, increase the burden. Just ask him to increase the burden. Ask him to increase the burden. Thank you, Lord. What I, what I want to do, I believe that there's a few that the Lord really is really stirred during this message to really want to go deeper into that. And I, what I want you to do, if that's you, I, I want to pray for you. And uh, just come on up to the front if you really are stirred for the, stirred where, I mean, I, I mean, I know all of us want to do it. Uh, we all want to respond, but we're, it's been like an awakening and a fresh stirring and you, you know that God's hand is upon you and you want to move deeper into that. Just come up. I want to, I want to just pray for you.
Now, I'm not trying to give this where, uh, an invitation where everybody would come, although I don't want to limit it to anybody that wants to come because I really believe that God wants to do some deep things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for this group that's here. Thank you, Lord. It's interesting that a lot of the ones that are up here are the young people. And I really believe that maybe, I don't want to like pick a leader here on the prayer line, but I really believe that, that there's a group that needs to be formed. Uh, and, some, and one of you or maybe somebody else would lead it that would focus on golden altar prayers. So, Father, I thank you, Father, for that. And just, uh, Lord, we just pray that you would just, just release an anointing. Lord, all the three things of, of it, burden, fervency, and travail. Do it, God, we pray. You're going to be a real intercessor, a travailer. You are. God's called you to do that. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Lord. But just increase that burden, fervency, and travail, we pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just pray. Increase it, God. Increase it. Increase it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. God's going to give you a special... Not that this would be the only thing you pray for, but a special call in to pray for people to come forth in intimacy and love and intimacy, that aspect. That's the foundation of Christ in us is all, is all of that. He's going to give you that anointing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for Samuel. He's going to be a Samuel. Thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. We ask, Father, that you just use him in mighty, mighty ways. And for Quentin as well, we thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this, this heart for God. Do a deep work there, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for Larry. Lord, we ask that you increase burden, fervency, and travail. Or give this man the anointing to travail even in the secret place in his home. We ask, Father, that travail, travail, travail would take place in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the day. We love you. Thank you for this service. We ask, Father, that you would pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the, for the stirring of the Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us. And, Lord, we say we give you full permission in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Give the Lord a praise.